Good morning. Welcome to worship. I want to welcome those of you here in the sanctuary. I want to welcome those of you joining us on our stream um, who are online, wherever you are worshiping with us this day. Um, let me begin with just a few uh, quick announcements. Um, hopefully you got your little insert that's here. Um, also, I just want to say it's communion today on our first Sunday of the month. So if you're here in the sanctuary, make sure you have your bread and your juice, which is here in the sanctuary. If you're worshiping with us on the stream, uh, make sure you have some bread and some juice nearby, and a little later in the service, we'll be participating together uh, in communion uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, our Growing Kindness Ministry continues on Monday nights at 6, if you'd like to come. They arrange flowers, and they take them out to spread a little bit of hope and kindness into our community that uh, can use it. So they meet every Monday at 6 here at the church. Next uh, Sunday... Um, September 11th, uh, this service, the 1030 service, we won't be in the sanctuary. We're going to be outdoors on the north side of the church property. That'll be our outdoor worship service. And then afterwards, we're going to have a potluck picnic. And so we're not going to tell you what to bring. You bring whatever you'd like. And it's just going to be wonderful. So um, we're going to do potluck picnic. We'll have activities. We'll have games. So that will be our worship and our potluck picnic and then all that going on afterwards. So come for that. Uh, this Wednesday begins the first of our, our fellowship meals, our open door bistro. Uh, we start at 515. It's casserole night. So come for some delicious casseroles. It's always our most popular night. Um, also that night, um, the youth group starts. So youth group starts uh, right after the bistro meal. And then at 7 o'clock, remember our chancel choir. It's their first, first rehearsal um, for the chancel choir as they begin their new season. So, all right. Um, and also, just one final announcement. The loose coin, any loose coins that are given today or throughout the month of September, um, the focus for this month will be on UMCOR, which is the United Methodist Council on Relief. So I want to invite you, if you're online, to use the comment section to say good morning. Uh, if you're in the sanctuary, turn and wave hello to someone, say good morning. Um, I also encourage you, if you're here, to fill out the welcome card or at the very least put your name. And if you have a prayer request, you can do that. Leave it in the plate as you leave. So I do want to welcome all of you to worship this day. I invite us to come ready to hear and be inspired and be transformed as we let the Holy Spirit break forth into our hearts and lives as we gather for worship. And so let us begin as we center our hearts and minds for worship with our centering music this morning. And so I want to invite up our, our group this morning. They'll be singing to God be the glory. And so I'm so grateful for all of them to come and center us with their music. To God be the glory. Thank you. 
Amen. Thank you. First of our uh, two scriptures this morning, the first one is the letter to Philemon found in the New Testament. For this reason, though I am more than bold enough in Christ to command you to do the right thing, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. Jesus says to us, Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. May God add a blessing to our hearing and living out of the word this day. Amen. I want to invite up Steve. Um, he's uh, going to be doing our young disciples time. So I want to invite up our young disciples and any young disciples watching, gather around the screen and uh, let's uh, join in our young disciples time. Thank you, Steve. All right, I brought my toolbox along today. <laughs> we'll see what's going on here. Okay. So. First, this is not a trick question. What do we have here? A piece of wood, yes. And what do we have here? Yes, a hammer. Now, what do you usually need in addition to these two things that's long, skinny, and made out of metal? A nail, okay. Looking in my toolbox, today I brought <clears throat> Unfortunately, a screw along. Now, yeah, <laughs> I guess I probably should try this and see how this works. So hopefully not too noisy, but any predictions on how successful I'm going to be? Not very far, not very good. Yeah, the tip of it went in without too much trouble, and that's about it. Hmm. So, sometimes, for some people, this is kind of how their lives are going someday. Things just are not working together the way they're supposed to. This is sometimes the way my life seems to be going on certain days. When that happens, maybe it's time to look in the toolbox again and see what we can find here, unfortunately. All right, any predictions now? Yes, I can actually get it through the board without destroying the board. If I keep going, I can probably screw this board right to the church through here so I am going to stop yes <laughs> but yes we're having no particular problem now we've got the right tool the right setup we're ready to go that's gonna work just fine okay that's kind of what we're talking about here um, you know if you just use the hammer on there, you can pound harder and harder and harder, and it's never going to work. You have to have the right tool for this to work. Well, we have a uh, Bible lesson today, Philemon and Onesimus. 
both of which names Tim helped me to pronounce properly. So if I drop it, it's not his fault. But there was a man named Onesimus who was a runaway slave. Well, being a runaway slave got you in a lot of trouble. Apparently, he may also have been a thief. We don't know, but it sounds like that's it. However, this guy, with all his trouble, became a very good friend of Paul, the disciple, uh, who was one of the great Christians of the New Testament. And Paul wrote a letter to another friend of his, Philemon, who owned this runaway slave. One interesting thing about the book of Philemon is, even though it's a book of the Bible, that's all of it. It fits on just two sides of the piece of paper. I looked, you know, you can put it in as Philemon chapter 1, but you really don't even need that. There is just only the one chapter, so you can put the verses. But it's an interesting story because we don't get a direct answer on what happened. It, this is Paul's like, would you please consider my friend Onesimus, who I know has run away, who I know may have stolen some things from you. Here's what I'd like to request. Could you just set him free and let him stay here with me and help with preaching the gospel to people? And the amazing thing is we have every reason to believe that's exactly what happened. So this is kind of a story about second chances for people. A little different than this, but Philemon, you know, basically was in a lot of trouble and he was given a chance to completely change his life and become a great um, champion of the gospel and to help Paul. All right. If you would join me for a prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us another chance when we make mistakes. Thank you for helping us to change and guiding us back in the right direction. And all God's children said, okay, thank you. Oops. <laughs> There, it does fit. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks for not screwing it right into the chancel. That was <laughs> stop right in time. <laughs> Thank you. So as I was um, growing up, my father um, always had a knack for finding and fixing uh, just about anything, anything. So anytime something broke, um, I would go to my dad and, and before I knew it, he would have it fixed. And especially with bicycles. So I'm the youngest in a family of four. I have three older brothers. And so if anybody here is a youngest in a family, what you know is, is you never get anything new as the baby of the family, right? Every single thing you own and wear, literally wear, is a hand-me-down, right? Everything comes to you uh, from those who are older. And so that happened with, with everything and especially happened with bikes. So my brothers would get bikes and then they'd outgrow them and then they'd be like, well, we'll give it to Tim. They'd often say, well, give it to little Timmy. <laughs> He'll get the bike. So anyway, they, my brothers rode them hard. So it seemed like every week I was coming to my dad with another problem uh, with the bike. And um, to me, these bikes were completely useless. In fact, I would always say, why do I have to have these bikes? They're just so completely useless. They don't work. But that useless bike in the hands of my dad with some duct tape and some screws and a lot of ingenuity became useful again. Of course, we all know that with just a little bit of duct tape, anything can be useful again, right? I mean, isn't that the truth in life? Um, but does that work on people too? You know, can people be made whole with just a little strategic bit of spiritual duct tape put in the right place? Can we find meaning and, and usefulness in our lives with just the right turn of a, a screwdriver? No, even duct tape and screwdrivers have their limitations, I'm sorry to say. 
There is, however, something that can indeed help us, that can heal our hurts, that can turn our lives around, give us focus and purpose and meaning, and, and help us to see just how really useful we are. And that's our faith and our relationship with Jesus. So it did that for a runaway slave named Onesimus. It did that for Philemon. It did that for Paul. And you know what? It does it for all of us today. So the book of Philemon is very interesting. You heard uh, Steve talk a little bit about it. Um, it is not really a book. It is a letter. <laughs> it's unlike anything that Paul wrote. Oftentimes, Paul would write to churches. He would write to communities. Um, and he'd be instructing them and imparting wisdom to these communities. But this is an instance where Paul wrote just a letter, a simple letter to one person on behalf of, of someone else. And um, it doesn't turn heads, maybe because of the subject matter. It's, it's about a slave, of this runaway slave, Onesimus, who had stolen something and had run away to be caught. So I should say that looking at slavery in the first century, when this letter was written, was very different than slavery in the 16th, 17th, 18th century of our time that we read. You know, slaves did have some rights. They could work their way into freedom, but it was still slavery. And the penalty for stealing was still incredibly severe. So Onesimus was scared, and he ran. And in his flight, he met Paul. We don't know how he met Paul, but we know their paths crossed. And so maybe that's a coincidence. Well, I heard this quote of a wise, wise words, and the quote was, a coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Isn't that great? Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. So of all the people to meet, it was certainly a God moment for Paul and Onesimus to get to know one another. So during this time, they became very, very close. Paul recognized God was at work in the life of this man, and so Paul went to work for, for Onesimus. He, he pointed out, you know, stealing and, and running away, the, the sin that that was, and then followed up with the good news of how Jesus had already paid the price for all of our sins. And as a result, we know from the letter that Onesimus was not only converted to the faith, not only became a disciple of Christ, but he also became an incredibly trusted and reliable helper to Paul, who at this point was on house arrest and had gotten pretty, pretty old. He's, he's, Paul's near the end of his life. He's needing lots of help, and Onesimus is there to help him. And so now this runaway slave is living up to his name. The name Onesimus, believe it or not, again, another God moment, the name Onesimus literally means useful. That's what his name means. So Paul writes this letter. That's all the back. He writes this letter to Philemon, saying that Onesimus is more than a slave now. He's a fellow brother in Christ. And so now he's sending him back to Philemon to forgive and to free, despite what wrong he's done. So Paul writes these words. So hear about the love and the care he has for Onesimus and the way he's reaching out to Philemon. He's saying, I'm sending him that is my own heart back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer a slave, but rather a beloved brother. And then Paul finishes with these words. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to both you and me. However, in writing this letter, Paul is also letting Philemon know that he has a problem. So what's the problem? It's this. If we take Jesus seriously, if we take the teachings and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus seriously, we will see Jesus at work changing the world, changing lives. And Jesus wants us, calls us to participate in his work of changing the world and changing lives with him. But doing this is going to be very hard because changing the world means we accept the reality that first and foremost, we need to be changed. We need to change some of our assumptions, change everything that we thought we could take for granted in the world. So for example, Philemon and Onesimus, one is a slave owner, one is a slave. Now they are both baptized brothers in Christ. 
They worship the same God. They receive the same gift of the Holy Spirit. They are nourished by the same communion, bread and wine. In many subtle and really not very subtle ways, Paul's message to Philemon is clear. If you, Philemon, take Jesus seriously, you have to change. You have to change the way you treat people, starting with Onesimus. We can no longer see anyone as useless or beneath us. We have to get rid of all of our labels, our beliefs that certain people are undeserving of grace without needing a word of hope. And this could be a problem. The whole economic structure of the ancient world in the first century was built on slavery. Everyone's livelihood depended on it one way or another. And Jesus came and he turns that whole system upside down. Because once a slave and a slave owner become siblings in Christ, everything has to change. How can one be owned by the other? That's Paul's argument to Philemon. So take, for example, our gospel reading from, from Luke. So before the part that I read, there's this really difficult teaching from Jesus where Jesus says these words. He says, you can't follow me unless you hate your father and mother, your spouse and children, and your whole life. Then he goes on through there to say, oh, you have to pick up your cross and renounce all your possessions. Now, it should be noted that when Jesus uses the word hate, when he says hate our families, we kind of run into a translation problem with the text. Jesus often spoke and he very often taught in what we call hyperbole, which is a very fancy word that means he used exaggerated statements that would shock and provoke thought. In fact, the Greek word that Jesus uses, what it means is, you have to love me first, love me fully, and then all your other love flows from that. Some scholars say that the Greek words are all about a relationship priority. So here's a, a simple fact of life, that what we worship, what we're in relationship with, what we make our priority, we very often become. So if we worship money, because all that means is we just make money the most important thing in our life, right? Obtaining it, acquiring it, everything. If we worship money, if that's our relationship, we will become greedy. If we worship stuff, if all we want is more and more and more stuff, we will become materialistic. If we worship relationships, like we need others' approval, we can't take a step without needing others' approval, we will become insecure. But if we come to worship and be in relationship with our Savior, who calls us to forgive endlessly and love radically and hope eternally and work for peace continually, then over time, we change. We become those things daily in our everyday life. So Philemon quickly discovered, once he took this love of Jesus seriously, and he stopped playing around with it. But once he took the love of Jesus seriously, his whole life, his whole economic and social world was turned around and upside down. Because now his servant, and think of this, his servant who had stolen from him, who had betrayed his trust, was now his brother in Christ. More than that, he needed to forgive him and free him because he is valuable and he is useful. However, you know, what do we do in our day-to-day -day life when we're around someone that we don't particularly care for? This is where our faith, where the rubber meets the road with our faith, with being a disciple of Christ, because you have a choice, right? You can either be with them and be in relationship with them, or we can ignore them, right? We could dismiss them, we could brush them aside. In our modern language, we have a new word. We talk about canceling people, right? We could cancel them. But the radical love of Jesus creates problems because this person is a sibling in Christ. They are a child of God. And we are called to treat them the way Jesus would treat them as we hear the words of the Sermon of the Mount echoing through the ages, touching our hearts and souls as Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. When we consider ourselves useless, or we consider others useless, 
and we don't live up to this life-changing love of Christ in our lives, putting that first, it causes problems, and it should cause problems. 400 years ago, the first Africans came to the New World, brought here against their will, brought on vast ships across the sea. They landed at a place that was called Point Comfort, which we now call Hampton, Virginia. They came to this land as slaves, as pure property, who could never work their way to freedom, by the way. Think how different our nation's history would have, would have gone if someone from the very beginning had stood up and said, we cannot treat these people as property and as slaves. We must instead treat them as children of God, as siblings in Christ. When Irish immigrants came, I, my last name is O'Brien, so I hear lots about Irish, my Irish roots. When Irish immigrants came to this country, they faced violent persecution in the cities of the Northeast. When Italians and Poles came here, they faced racial and cultural hatreds. What about our current refugees and immigrants? Our congregation is doing all we can, striving to be lights to the refugees who are here, particularly our own family from Syria, who we've really fallen in love with. But you know what? Not everybody has this experience, and our group hears the stories of those who are refugees in our country who don't receive the same treatment that our people are getting as we are extending the love and care of Christ. Today, human trafficking continues. Young people are seized. Their lives are stolen. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. Doesn't Christ want us to have a problem with this? Isn't Christ demanding that we treat children at the border the way we would treat Christ? Isn't Christ demanding that we treat the prisoner on death row, the hungry veteran down the street, the family member with dementia, the lonely neighbor, the way that we would treat Jesus himself? Again and again and again, we see Jesus with the people of his day who are cast aside, like Philemon wanted to do with Onesimus, who are cast aside, who were ignored. The sick, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the Gentiles. To each of them, he welcomed them. He healed them. He fed them. He loved them, called them to be his disciples. For each of them, he looked beyond the labels that were given them by others and saw them for who they are, children of God, full of value and deserving of new life and incredibly useful. And that is the challenge for us today. And am I saying this is easy? It very often isn't. But that is the challenge we're given in our faith today to see with the eyes of Christ those that are put in our path. Because we are all useful. No matter our age, no matter our, our physical condition, no matter what we have done, no matter what our history is, no matter what we look like, what we've done, no matter what label we may ascribe to someone, all of us are useful. We are useful because we are children of God, because Jesus died for everyone. Jesus died for the world. We don't need tremendous talents to make a difference in someone's life. This is all we need. The only thing we need to make a difference in another human being's life is this. Pick up your cross. In other words, like Paul said to Philemon, take your faith seriously. Take the love of Christ seriously. Pick up your cross. Keep your focus. Love Jesus first. Love Jesus first and fully as we focus on the eternal things of God, not the things of this world that are temporary, that rust, that decay, that pull us away from one another, that are meaningless. Focus on the things of God so that out of this divine love, of putting this divine love first in our lives, first in our hearts, first in our souls, first in how we act, we go to tell and show another person and mean it, Jesus loves you. And you don't often have to use words. It's great to use words. But you know what? That's powerful. And that's meaningful. That's a message that changes and allows hearts and minds and souls to be transformed. That's the message that Paul shared with a man named Onesimus. 
and it changed his entire life. If we take him seriously, if we take Jesus and the gospel and his life and his death and his resurrection seriously, we will be challenged, all of us, but we will also be given amazing opportunities to be strengthened, to continue his work in our world, where every time we gather in community, whether we're here in person or we're online, but where we gather in community, we are nourished in our faith through the body and the blood of Christ that connects us together. Because in this time when we come to the table, what we're doing is we're saying, yes, Jesus, I put your love first in my life. So as a child, I always look forward to helping my dad fix, fix bicycles. It was neat to see how an old bike would, in, would not be useless, how indeed I was always proved wrong by my dad. And yes, these bikes with their dings and dent that were not perfect still had a lot of life left in them and still had a lot of use left in them. And that is what our faith reveals. And that is what I want to challenge each one of us today to realize. We are not perfect. The people we meet in our lives are not perfect. But through the grace of Jesus Christ, we are all useful tools and vessels and servants of a perfect love, of Christ's love. So let us go forward boldly and joyfully with the work and the challenges that God has sent in front of us. No matter what our life is like, let us go forward to use all of our gifts all of our skills, all of our blessings of God to love this world completely and fully as we together break down the walls in front of us and bring forth the kingdom of God and the kingdom of hope for all. May it be so, friends. Amen. Amen. Let us join in response uh, with our hymn, Christ has broken down the wall. Uh, it will be on the screen, or otherwise it's in the green hymnal. Let's join in song, Christ Has Broken Down the Wall. So let us come to join in prayer as we are connected together. Um, and so I want to invite those who are online um, to use the comment section 
um, to put on any joys or any concerns that you may have this morning. Um, and I have some prayers here that I'm going to share. And then I will invite any that are gathered here in person um, to lift up your joys and lift up your concerns. So let me just get here. All right. So again, I will... Um, now I'm online. All right. This is how we're going to be connected together <laughs> this morning, no matter where we're worshipped. So again, if you're online, just use the comment section to put any of the prayers that you have. But let me start with the ones from this morning's, from the early service, and those that were called in. Um, so prayers for uh, Mary and Bob and Mike, who are known to George Davidson, each of them struggling with some health issues, and they would like some prayers. Um, I see that uh, Mary Landra is joining us. She's not here in person anymore, but she's still watching us. And so um, I know she has prayers for um, Tom and Carol Rogers, especially for Tom, who continues to be in Wisconsin Rapids Health Center. So prayers for him, prayers for Pat Doherty and Lois Kiddo um, on this day. Uh, prayers for Jim and Julie Cormack with their health issues, especially for Jim, um, who's in hospice care. And so prayers for him. Prayers for Rick, who's a friend of uh, Dave and Melanie, um, as he recovers from his stroke. Um, prayers for Larry Iverson's older sister, um, who's been in the hospital for a week. She is getting better, but continued, some prayers of continued recovery for Larry's uh, sister. Um, prayers for a, a peace in our world, uh, wherever, wherever that is needed. Um, this morning, there was a, a prayer for the children of Ukraine as they go back to school. Um, because in many parts of the country, they're going back to school while shells are still falling and the war is continuing. And so prayers for these children who are trying to get back to a normal life in the midst of a war and prayers for peace there. Um, and prayers for our own refugee family uh, from Syria this Tuesday. Uh, six of the kids go to school in three different schools. And so, you know, our, our kids do not know English all that well, but they are going. The, the ESL department here at the school district is amazing, and they're doing great work, and I know they'll learn English before you know it. But um, we have to get all of them off to school, and we're going to be walking with them or take them to bus stops. And so just prayers for our family. They've been here for three weeks. Um, again, refugees from Syria. Um, and, and we are just extending Christ's light and love to them to help them be settled um, here in our community. So continued prayers for, uh, for that family. Um, prayers for uh, John and Melanie Wiltsey and their family. Um, several of their family members are in the hospital uh, recently. And so just prayers for them uh, with their family in this time. All right. Um, let me do some prayers that are here. Uh, all right. So Joseph... Uh, from Ghana is watching us. Good to see you, Joseph, <laughs> to know you're here. Watching you live from Ghana. Uh, last week's center, we missed your service due to some unforeseen circumstances. We're really enjoying. Oop, I got to hit read more because it goes on. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Uh, so uh, please consider my prayer requests. Need for special uh, prayers for marriage, for spiritual growth, for God's wisdom and protection for the orphanage. Joseph runs the orphanage or is overseeing the orphanage there in Ghana. So prayers for that. And then my special greeting to uh, Pastor Tim and John W. Munson. You know, John, he always uses different ways. <laughs> I refer to you. And uh, Mrs. Barb and Sue Jacobson. Hey, she's right there. And all church members, especially church choir and uh, executive director, founder, leader of Faith Charity. So, Joseph, thank you for your prayers uh, this morning. Uh, from John, prayers for our son Rob, who is recovering from surgery last week. So, so for John Wilsey, prayers for his, he and Melanie's son Rob this morning. And um, I think that's it for online. If I'm missing something online, just post it again. Oh, here's one from Althea. Prayers for my mom, Althea Ruby, who's been recovering in rehab facility and in dialysis. Uh, Mary Landreth, prayers for our safe trip home tomorrow. We had a great time. I believe she's in Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken. So prayers for Mary Landreth for her safe trip uh, home tomorrow and then for Althea Ruby. So thank you for those of you online putting your prayers. This is the way we're connected no matter where we are worshiping. I appreciate that. How about those of you here in the sanctuary with me? Um, any prayers or joys? We'll start with Barb and uh, Yvonne's going to give you a mic so that we can hear you and more importantly, those online can hear you. So far. 
Uh, my dear friend over in Plymouth, Peggy, is going to be having surgery again for some more tumors in her leg on September 12th. So keep her in your prayers, please. All right. Prayers for Peggy for healing. And then with Mary. I have two actually this morning. One is a joy. Our little Alma, who turned one on August 13th, she's our little Syrian baby, took her first steps this week. So oh. she is now walking. So that's exciting. <laughs> uh, and Yay. then um, prayers for the family of Sharon Patoka, who passed away this week unexpectedly. So they just lost their dad a couple of years ago, and now they lost mom. And so the boys and grandsons are needing to adjust now with no parents. So thank All you. All right. So prayers for that family in the midst of their loss and a prayer of joy for, yeah, for our Syrian family and for little baby Alma, who we celebrated her, but we got to celebrate her one year birthday and now she's walking. So that's a great joy. Madra. So your cousin Lisa's grandson, we've been praying for him, Jameson. He was born premature and could not gain weight in and out of the hospital. As of today, he's seven pounds, one ounce. And so he's doing so much better. Keep praying for him, please, and for the family. All right. So for uh, my cousin Lisa and, and for their little one and, and uh, getting stronger. So we pray for continued healing there. All right. Marianne. I have um, a prayer request for my very best friend for 79 years who is taking on a new journey in her life. She's moving to North Carolina, uh, so she's near her daughter, and um, I want prayers for her that she can find friends and be happy there. All right. Also, I would like, I've got prayer of thanks for everybody that wished us well when Glenn was in the hospital, and, and he still has a recovery, but um, prayers for that. All right. So a great joy to see Glenn here out of the hospital and uh, getting better, but a road of, he's on a journey of recovery. <laughs> healing is never a, like a light, it's always a journey. So continued prayers for healing and strength for Glenn and um, prayers for your friend of 79 years who begins a new chapter in their life moving to North Carolina. We pray for them this morning. Other, oh, over here with Maggie. I, too, am working with a refugee, Muhammad, and would appreciate just prayers of support. He is 63 years old, and he is working so hard to develop um, marketable skills, um, especially working to improve his English. He told Eric and I the other day he has such ambition he would work two jobs. So <laughs> he certainly has been a delight to our lives, and we just pray that he is able to get a job, um, whatever it is, as soon as possible. All right. Our prayers for Mohammed, your team's uh, refugee, and prayers for Mohammed as he, uh, you know, works on a lot of skills and wants, and wants to work. <laughs> and that's great. So we pray for Mohammed this day and the opportunities for him. Other uh, prayers this morning, joys that you have or concerns? All right. Well, let us bring all these prayers. Whether you voiced them or not, it doesn't matter. We all come with joys. We all come with things that we are blessed by and blessed with. And we all come with prayers in our hearts for friends and family and neighbors and, and our world around us. And I want to invite us to bring all of those prayers because they all matter and they're all important to God. And they connect us together as a people of God. So let us bring all these prayers and let's offer them in prayer. Oh God, you give us multiple blessings and you call each of us to use them for this world that you have given us. Open our eyes, O oh God, to see each gift of talent as precious in your sight with those in need. Open our hands to share what you have first given us. Open our hearts to be filled to overflowing with your compassion. Help us to be a people of courage, living out our faith boldly, taking risks as far as we can dream knowing that, that each of us and each person we meet is indeed useful to you, that they are loved by you. Help us to know that on the path of life, none of us journey alone, for you are with us in times of joy and times of hurt and struggle. 
So now we come as a people of prayers. We pray for those in need in our families, in our church, in our community, in our nation, in our world. We rejoice with those who have joys this day, those that are um, with family or friends uh, celebrating momentous events, maybe birthdays or anniversaries. Um, we give thanks for the joy of prayers of our church family um, as we pray for one another and support and lift one another up. Um, we give thanks for the beauty of this world that you have given us that inspires us. And we give thanks for the joy of, of our faith in Christ, who is our rock and our redeemer upon whom we stand. But we also come with our hearts full of concern. And so we pray for those who are on our hearts, those we've named and those on our hearts who might be ill this day, suffering with sickness or, or injury. And we want to pray for your healing presence to be with them. We want to remember those who are grieving this day and pray for your comfort and your peace to be with them. We want to pray for all those who, uh, who are struggling this day with whatever may be in front of them. And we want to, we want to pray, O oh Lord, that each of us knows that we rest in the palm of your hands. No matter what we are going through, we rest in your strength. So for all these concerns, O oh God, for all these prayers, those that are named and those in our hearts, we lift them to you. Bind us together into the community of faith that this world needs for the living of these days. Turn our prayers into deeds that we might continue to be your servants of your presence, offering your hope, showing and sharing your love. And so, oh Lord, all these prayers we lift to you in the name of the one who came to be one with us, who walks with us. The one who cares for us so much, he went to the cross for us. Oh Lord, all these prayers, all these joys and concerns we lift to you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So we do come as a, a blessed people in many, many ways, large and small. And so this morning, the morning offering, if you're here in person, I invite you to place in the offering plate as you leave the sanctuary. Um, if you're here or online, I invite you to mail in your offering to the church office. Use our website, stevenspointumc.org, and our donate button. I want to thank you for all the ways you have generously given to support our mission and our ministry that allow us to be lights of Christ to this community and beyond. And so for this opportunity we're given to recognize our blessings and to respond, let us pray. O oh God, giver of every good gift, we thank you for this opportunity we're given to recognize our many, many blessings and to give back. May the gifts that we give, our time, our talents, our treasures, nourish our ministries as we continue to reach out to serve and share, united by your grace and your hope and peace that binds us all together as the body of Christ. May we together be signs of your love and care and compassion to those in need. Oh Lord, bless all that we give this day. Bless our giving and bless our sharing in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you um, to take your elements, your bread and your juice. Don't take them yet, but just uh, get those ready. If you're joining us online, I invite you to get your elements ready. Have them nearby as we come to offer this blessing to them. Remember that this table is open to all. Participating in communion is not restricted to any. <laughs> no one is kept away. Everyone is welcome at this table. So I invite us with our elements in our hands to um, pause as we offer this blessing for them. Blessed are you, almighty God, our Alpha and our Omega, source of our faith and our hope and our love. Through your word, you created all things, and you called them good. And in you we live and move, and we have our very being. When we have fallen away, you have not deserted us or abandoned us. For you so loved the world that you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, your word, who became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and full of truth. Holy are you, and blessed is Jesus Christ, who uses all that we give and all that we are as he calls us to follow and to serve and to share to grow as disciples in faith and hope and love as we gather around this table 
We remember how Jesus gathered at another table with his disciples, how he took the bread, how he blessed it and broke it, giving it to them, saying, take and eat, for this is my body given for you, so that you may be my body, my hands, my heart, my feet for this world. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, that you may be my people of forgiveness and my people of mercy. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, God, pour out your Holy Spirit wherever we are gathered on this day and on these gifts, that in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, we come now to be nourished. As we with open hearts and hands come to be filled and led once again by the Spirit, as we join in that prayer that shapes us and forms us, as we pray together wherever we are gathered, with one heart and one voice, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to uh, take your bread and take your cup. So first, the bread. The body of Christ given for us all. And the cup, the blood of Christ shed for us all. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for this time, this opportunity to come to this table where all are welcomed and all are received, to come to this table, to have our eyes and our hearts and our hands opened, to realize that we are indeed your useful servants and vessels to be filled with your love that we may pour that forth on to this world. Thank you for this opportunity to be nourished once again in our faith, to be reminded again as we gather around this table as one body that we are not alone, that as we are called around this table, we look around it and see those around the table and those who are not, but see those in need. And we, we feel all of the blessings you've given us that we may respond to them out of your love, the love that we have now received through this sacrament that reminds us of the depth and the breadth and just how far you went to show that love by dying and rising for our sake. Our Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for this great gift that we have now received. Let us treasure it. Let us live out this love and grace and hope in all that we do, and in all that we say, and all the ways we act as we depart from this table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to join in our closing song, uh, 2129, I've Decided to Follow Jesus. Let's join in song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross behind for me, the world behind me, the 
cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, still I will follow, though none go with me. So let's go forward this day in faith, living in hope, sharing God's love. Let us go this day, all of us, to spread words of kindness, live lives of peace, caring compassionately, serving graciously, praying unceasingly in all that we do. Go in peace, friends, till we gather again. Amen. As we close our service with our postlude. <laughs>